All right. And let me share my screen. All right. Hey, are you there, Marty? Mm-hmm. Ciao, Martin. Ciao, Kevin. Ciao, everybody. Hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Ciao. How are you? Doing Good. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Better now. <laughs> yeah, so because I, I can't see very well on, on, on this screen on my mobile phone, but, you know, I've seen, uh, I couldn't see Martin, but I'm glad to hear your voice, Martin, again, and, uh, of course, Gavin, and uh, our, our friends, yes. Right. Martin, you want to start this off? Yeah. Um, so I'm not too well versed in this. And, uh, John, John, you might be well versed in this. So anything that I come through that uh, that doesn't really make sense or something you might want to add, let me know. And for like uh, Kevin and Fabrizio and uh, even you, Rob, or Glennis, you know, something that you might really want to think about if you're getting into music production. Um, the magic is within the producer. You might think that you're the one who's making the great music when you're strumming the guitar or playing the piano or whatever, but that's that's just not, that's not true. It's uh, It's the producer. So... The producer makes is the great mix mixes what you hear happen um the brute the producer has reshaped the sounds and mixed the sounds into a masterpiece makes sure to find uh make sure you find yourself a great producer so if we go with low quality production then you know somebody hey I'm, i'll do that for you for 10 bucks you know you're gonna you're gonna get to you get out what you put in i guess right so yeah yeah betting yeah and finding so you the could right. you could strum your guitar all day long you know and and sing and stuff like that but you're gonna <laughs> one second all right uh but Sorry, Fabrizio, i had to put you on mute there's too much background noise but you're not going to be able to create that radio quality mix. Say we're using Audacity or something. That's not going to happen. You're gonna you're gonna have a a scratch sound, you know, a little demo sound, but it's not going to be really great. Don't send in bad quality if you want great results. You know, like MP3s and stuff like that. I mean, it's okay, but if you want real radio quality, if you want studio quality, I should say. Recording great quality doesn't just take time. It also takes knowledge. So you got to know what you're doing. Uh, recording in WAV format and sitting in WAV format, it's a great option. Take your time for recording. Do this over and over if you have to. Send the best of what you tracked to be mixed. If you just send in the first couple takes to be mixed, well, expect that to exactly be what that is because you sent it in. Unless person mixing it is like hey i'll use that and i'll like remix it and i'll do all this kind of cool stuff to it and you're like all right and if it comes out cool it comes out cool but you want a specific sound then track that sound over and over until you get it exactly where you want that sound to be because if you don't the producer might stretch that sound out to make it on beat and to you that's going to make you feel like that that's not you you know that's not your signature. Uh, that's not your vibrato. That's not that's not you. You'll know as an artist. Other people might not know that's not you. But if you're having an album out there or something, and you got a lot of fans, they're gonna listen to that and they're gonna go, that ain't that ain't that ain't right. That don't feel right. That, that's not him. You know, they know your signature. Um, say like Matchbox Twenty or Creed or Nickelback. You hear them. And if you hear their vocals a little bit stretched out or something, their vibrato's changed, you're going to be like, huh, that sounds funny. And you're going to pick that up as a listener. So really think about that when you send something in and work closely with the uh, producer. And if you are the producer, then 
work closely with the per, uh, person that you're mixing the track for. Um, so you might not be that great at mixing, which I'm not. So you get to know other producers, watch them work, learn uh, how they do what they do. You may find yourself becoming more familiar with mixing and really what DAW are they working in? Digital audio workstation and find out what tools they're working with. Find out what VSTs they're working with, how they do them. Ask questions. You might bug them. They might be like, whoa, dude, go learn this. Yeah, dude, go learn it. Go learn it from YouTube. But you know, the best experience you're going to have is watching them do it and then you doing it and finding out what's right for you. Um, route to more than one channel. Routing to one channel can greatly reduce control over what you're working with. Setting up a better routing system will give you much greater control over your product. So let's let's give an example. You have six tracks, okay? Um, and you have one main. Now, you can control those six tracks with that one main. Let's take that one main and make it two mains, okay? And then we'll have those two mains are split now. And we're going to split those two mains to three tracks each individual. So now on one main, you're controlling three tracks. And on the other main, you're controlling three other tracks. So that gives you a lot of control over that. And then you finally have your main out, which you can control that too. So you're just kind of routing downward instead of putting your main straight to all those six tracks. So that's something that you can, and that's just a production tip. This all comes from renegadeproducer.com, by the way. So if I'm wrong, they're wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, man. We right, all save... have our own takes on all of it, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. Save your work. I think everybody would agree to this. Don't just re-record because something went wrong. Save your work. You might have had a really great sample in the work that went bad. And we've probably all experienced when we're recording something and we're like, no, no, different take. And then we go, you know, that previous recording, there was that one sound in there. There's that one highlight in that one. Ah, oh, man, why did I delete that? Um, I've had that plenty of times. So save your work. And uh, if you don't save your work, then you might lose the best of what you had. Plus, you don't want to restart all over again. So imagine your DAW shutting down because you didn't save your work. So just every like five minute intervals, if it doesn't automatically save, save your work. Um, Studio One, it does automatically save, but I think you have to set it up to where it's already a saved thing. So you, you got to go in there, you got to file, save it, save as, make a name for it, and then it starts its process up. But if it shuts down and you didn't start that process, your whole your whole entire stuff is just gone, right? Well, one would say you'd have to go in there and dig it up and look for it deep inside your file system. You don't want to do that. Save your work. Uh, you don't want the worst to happen and you lose everything. Take your time, by the way. Let's uh, think about this. Rushing to get something out there. It's okay to do if you absolutely have to. Yep, I missed about that. Throwing caution to the wind isn't always the best thing to do. Relax, feel the music, hear different things within the tracks that you might want to add in because you don't want to think about this later. You don't want to be like later on down the road, a month from now going, oh, dude, if I just would have put that in there, I could hear those trumpets. You know, I could hear those trumpets. No, hear those trumpets before you send it in to get mixed or before you mix it, before you finalize it and put it out to the world. Um, of course, you could make a second addition to the song, you know, um, a remix and put that out there. But you really want your first song to, to have that big bang that you're looking for. Here are different things. About, Marty, this looks what? like it's spelled perfectly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here are different things within the track that you might want to add in. Think about your music as if you, as if it was, as a, blah, 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 blah. You heard me right. As if it was a painting. Uh, I, I just, let's say like Vincent Van Gogh or whatever. 
let's do he's uh painting and somebody's like hurry up man finish it right well he's gonna take his time he's gonna take his time he's gonna make sure that everything that's inside his brain gets out of his brain and that it's it's beauty it's beauty to him um i don't know if he liked his paintings or not i'd have to do research but take your time think about your music as if it was a painting don't rush it if you don't have to find out what's right for you uh is being tidy with your files or being messy this is philosophy right here i, I spell sometimes wrong as well so is being tidy with your files or being messy with them the best for you so renegadeproducer.com wants you to tidy up your files that's what they say that it's a music tip for tidy up your files that it will help you create a better creation process and stuff like that um that's not what i've run into and that's not i think what like 99 percent of uh people that are being creative run into you can be in a chaotic situation or a non-chaotic situation whatever way to get you inspired you can have messy files or not messy files so if you have messy files and you, and you and you tidy them up see if that works for you if it doesn't and you want to make your files messy again that's perfect if that's how you work that's how you work um think about various ways that could inspire you sometimes inspiration comes out of nowhere do the opposite of what you would normally do that could be very creative and again, this is really all philosophy when it comes to find out what's right for you because you could be walking down the street and there you have it. You have a whole entire song written. Or you could force yourself to go to a place that you don't want to go. And, you know, maybe you don't like the outdoors, you don't like camping, but there you found your inspiration, you know, because you get bit by a whole bunch of mosquitoes and stuff like that. You know, it's something weird, but it could happen. But you can either put yourself out there for uh creativity or you could just stay exactly where you're at thinking exactly what you want to think it's really about is What's anybody that? else hearing that i'm hearing yeah. it. it's like a dial-up tone okay so not necessarily knowing where that i'm on a mute yeah, I didn't huh. hear anything. What are you hearing? I'm hearing it. Yeah. It's like a shh. Shh. Yes. I'm hearing too. Hold on. That's really weird. There, it's, it's okay gone. Now. It's yeah. gone. It's yeah. gone. It's gone. Oh. No, it's back. It's back. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not hearing it? I don't know. I don't uh, know. Is it coming from Glenn? Could be yours. Yeah, is it coming from me? Exactly. Go I go out of my car. I'm just not, mute your mic. For it wasn't me. Yeah. Okay, I'll mute, mute it. Mic. Hold on a sec. Yeah, oh, it's her. No. It was her. I heard it go away. So Glennis is using dial-up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys, you got to find out. Is it right my fan? You. Oh, it could be. Yeah. I'll, I'll just go on mute then. Do you hear it again now? No. Okay. No. No. Okay. No. Yeah. no. Right. It's okay now. So. Nope. It's there. Oh, all right. It's when her, her mic opens up from the gate. So finding out what's right for you is definitely a philosophical thing, or it's you know a personal thing because you, you literally could just stumble upon what's right for you in the moment, and the moment always changes. Make sure to take breaks on your path forward. Um, taking breaks is super important. The more you obsess over something, the worse chance you have to make creativity. Uh, you'll find yourself locked up a little bit. Yeah. Give yourself breaks. Clear your mind. Let the inspiration come back to you. Okay, so you lost in inspiration. That sucks. Mm -hmm. Take some time. I don't care if it's 10 months two years it will come back and when it comes back you'll be happy that you saved your work again we're back to save your work you'll be happy that you saved your work so put notes by the way on your work too like what levels were you at when you're recording what mic did you have okay not just your levels on your mixer but what were your levels on your computer what was the uh, audio input you know what computer did you use because all computers are different when it comes to audio 
and you don't want to get back on the mic and it sounds way louder than it used to, you know? How far were you away from your mic? These are all important things to note down before you shut down even recording for the day. If you just leave your stuff up, and I know you guys know this, if you just leave your stuff up and running with all your levels set, all your equalizer set, everything's set, you're going to come back the next day and you're going to be right back where you started. But if you turn that stuff down, if you shut down and you try to get that back to where it was, that's a hassle. So, so you're taking keeping notes, a, super a notebook? Yes. It's super important to take little tiny notes of where exactly everything was in your recording process so that when you get back mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. it will sound virtually the same. Kind of archive. Yeah. Is, um, take a photo of your mixer and then you'll have that on Google Photos. And then when you come back to the song, look up the photo and you can see where all the dials and, and sliders were. Yeah, and make sure that, again, you go to your Windows settings if you're using a Windows computer and you check your recording input, you know, what um, controller, USB, whatever you're using, you know, what audio codec you're using, uh, what levels are they at? And little tiny things, too, if you set properties inside of the levels, did you advance? Um, there's a thing in windows if you right click on it you go into your music thing and you go to your recording and there's like an advanced tab that you can like have loudness equalization to make it louder for you um yeah uh over over two mm. right there so yeah right click on that and sound settings Let's see if Windows 11 is like this. Wow, this is a little bit different. So um, let's do output devices. Let's see if that thing comes up. It's a help. Just a troubleshooter thing? Really? I know nothing about 11. <laughs> let's go down and scroll down and see. Really? This one? Hello? You, know, you can do uh, loudness equalization. And if you have that turned on and then you turn that off, or it gets turned off in the future by default, you know, also, and I'm getting way too far into it, but something to note down is if your computer updates, say your windows driver updates right for audio just right there that's when you're going to try to find what's best for you you know you already have your mixer set you have your audio drivers set to the right volumes but something's not coming out right right it could be maybe in your mixing mixing uh your daw if your levels aren't set right in your daw but just now you're now you're at the point where you have to get it back to you know check one two mic check one two do some singing a little bit let the inspiration come back to you don't rush there are many ways to get your work finished but only way the only one way it will finally be done and that is when the work has finally been completed by you or somebody else sometimes you have to put rules in place and sometimes you have to just break the rules when it comes to production it's really up to you and uh, the final results are what matter the most because say that you're on track to something and you're like man that just don't sound right and to you it just doesn't sound right you're not feeling it but it's totally against the rules if what you're about to do i want to play that and, it, and it's and it's off beat and it just sounds really strange you know but it feels right if that's what it feels like to you then that's what you need to do because that's where your creativity comes in you know going away from what every, every standard is and taking it to where you want it to be. Um, let's go to the last one, and that's just great quality. And again, this is from renegadeproducer.com. There is more there, so you can go check that out later on. Great production takes time. This is the same from the beginning to the end. You may find yourself stuck. But once you get over the hump, you'll find yourself only moving faster and making the process flow better. Push past the things that stop you. 
find ways to keep going. Time is your friend when it comes to production. You are your own worst critic when it comes to production. I, I added this last part because this is true. Time really is your friend. People say, oh, we don't got enough time. We have plenty of time. Time is your best friend when it comes to production. And you can't put, and I got to stress this, you can't put, if you're not a famous artist, okay, if you're not making bank off of it, you can't put music over it. Because then you're just going to be stressed over music all day long and then you can't get any of the projects done. So take your time. You know, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you have an idea, go for it. That's great inspiration. It just happened. Take your time. Time is your friend. You are your own worst critic when it comes to production. So you're the one that's going to slow yourself down. You're the one that's going to halt your process. And, and that's not always a bad thing. You know, people might get a little bit irritated, you know, saying, when's your new song going to come out? Well, you told them two weeks, but, you know, two weeks later, you're like, huh, I don't think that I'm ready to release this yet. But, okay, so maybe it's not just you that slows yourself down. Maybe it's a producer that slows you down, right? Because you're trying to get something done. And they're off on meetings or something. Maybe they're in Brazil, you know? I don't know. But that's the time that you got to take to yourself and say, okay, well, that that happened, so we're just going to wait. And don't try to push it out yourself, you know, because if you got a really good producer, wait for your producer, whatever your producer may be doing. Um, let's say, let's just make up a name here. Let's say Bob Ross, okay, was producing my song. <laughs> and Bob Ross is a great painter. Well, maybe he's a great producer too. Um, and I put a lot of work into this. And I handed it over to Bob Ross. And it was like, Bob Ross, take it away. So Bob Ross is like, just totally AFK for three weeks. Right? Don't hear from him. Now I'm worried a little bit. Where's my where's my stuff? You know? So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm just gonna do it myself. Don't do that. You do it yourself, you don't know what you're doing. You ain't you're not gonna get the results that Bob Ross is gonna get you. You know, just wait until Bob Ross gets a hold of you and says, Hey, this is what's going on, and we'll be back into production soon. So you're either the artist or the producer, or you're the artist and the producer. And if you're just the artist and you hand everything over to the producer, don't try to be the producer. You can become a producer, but don't rush these steps just because you want to get your music released out there. And I'm trying to say this because everybody and their neighbor on Discord rushes everything. They just want to get it up on SoundCloud. And it's, I'm sorry, guys, it sounds like crap. And, and I'm like, hey, you know, and they're like, what do you think, Plucky? And I'm like, it's good. It's good. And it's good. It's not great. It's not fantastic. Because they're rushing it. Because they just want to get it up. Because they're hyped up. They think their friends think it's cool. Their friends think it's cool. It must be cool. You know what I'm saying? No. You got to have, well, what did we talk about a long time ago? We have to have little audiences, right? Mm -hmm. uh, focus groups. You got to have focus groups and you want to put your song out there. That's cool. But run it through focus groups first. That's a production tip for you. Because you don't want to waste money on something that everybody's going. That sucks, man. I'm going to be honest with you. There were some really bad vibes in it. All right. Cool. 30 people thought so, but you know what? Maybe 30 people uh, elsewhere won't think so. No, dude. If 30 people thought that it was just horrible in your focus groups, rethink what you're putting out there. So I'm handing this back over to Rob, and I don't know how I get through this so fast. What is it, 12.05? Yep. No, it felt like I was talking forever. <laughs> you did great. Hold on. 
<laughs> All good tips. Excellent. Uh, there is the URL. I'll be sending this out later. Um, I do have two quotes for the week. Maybe I've used one of them before, but I like it. So I'm going to do it again. Uh, the first one is you are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. I'm not going to try and pronounce that name, but I'll use a five. Thank you. <laughs> and the next one is success is not final failure is not fatal it is the courage to continue that counts winston churchill oh, oh i like this ah nice quotes great rob i like them both yeah, very yes yeah. So john from a production standpoint how do you weigh in on these uh music production are you um how, how deep do you want me to go because I, I mean i could make comments on everything that was said sure. um you can yeah you, know, you i mean i can um i'll just i'll tell you what let's let me just go through the list if you can scroll up a little bit sure um and i can give you kind of my input I consider myself two different things, an artist, well, three different actually, artist, engineer, and producer. So And, and pilot. And pilot. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you define, and, and some people get, you know, there, there's always going to be fuzzy lines uh, between, you know, in, in all of these steps, you know, you see a movie screen and you'll see producer produced by co-produce uh executive produce uh what what does all that mean you know what what are those roles uh engineer uh sound engineer you know on-site management you know this you know you see this in movies a lot and but if you go back to the 60s and 70s and you read those things even as movies that are as popular as like the Wizard of Oz, you know, for instance, they maybe have three or four people that they, you know, that they they list. This was the the conductor or, you know, the musical arranger or whatever. And um, over the years, I think there's been so many people that get involved in projects that they've felt the for some reason that they've had to give them roles or they've had to create a segment of I consider an executive producer as the guy with the money, you know, and he's the top dog that if there is a some sort of a I'm not, I'm not I think conflict is a, is a too harsh of a word. But if there is a disagreement between artist and producer. Well, the guy with the money is the guy that gets to say yes or no, you know, he gets to, he gets to be the the vote, the vote tie guy uh he needs to be he, he gets to be that guy because it's his money he's the one backing it so the only thing that i that i would comment is you know what when you talk about the magic within the producer um and let me back up just a little bit because we all have our own taste i hate liver i hate it i can't stand to eat liver but i'm sure a couple of you guys like it you know i i to me, if I put it in my mouth, it's bitter. I can't tan I can't handle it. That's my preference. Music is the same way. When you start talking about focus groups and stuff like that, those are all well and good. But it really is determinant on taste. And we all have our own opinions of what we like and what we dislike. And there are certain sounds that my ears might perk up to and they may not to you or there's a certain style of music that I perk up to that wouldn't necessarily be your cup of tea so then you so you have that those are objective very valid um things that need to be considered when you're when you're establishing yourself as an artist or producer or whatever I couldn't I couldn't get in and do a jazz group I couldn't produce a jazz group if you if you you know, if I if I tried, I just I, I can't because it's not my cup of tea. You know, you give me a a retro rock or a 
Christian contemporary music or something like that. And, and I'm, I'm there, I'm there all day long. And yes, the magic is within the producer to a degree. I believe that the communication between the artist and the producer is so vital that the artist convey first after doing the research on I'm trying to find a person that they think is capable by listening to the stuff that they've done, which is something that I mean that should go unmentioned that you do your research on the people that you're wanting to involve with. And then when you do decide on a person, let's say you've listened to samples of what they've done and you trust it, that that is the stuff that they have done, either you've watched them do it or you know for a fact that they are responsible for that material that you just listened to and you make your decision on that producer, then it's up to you to really say, look, you produced this and that's what I'm looking for. And then you start to interject. Maybe it's not perfect of what you're looking for, but it's something that is really close to it. And you can interject then to the producer. I like everything about that, that what you did there, except for I don't like the flutes or I don't like brass in my stuff. Can you just do when you produce my stuff? Can you think on the same terms and the same sonic value that you did? But take take the brass out of it. Now he may argue with you and say, "Well, that's a that's a real important part of what that was." So I mean, I don't know how I can do that. But the communication is what's key. Is that at that point, then you can you know um, then you can establish that communication level of of whatever you know. So. But I think all of us, you know, if you if you consider yourself an artist or a songwriter or whatever, we all have a little bit of that producer within us. You know, we the, what divides a quote unquote producer or or, you know, from, you know, from us as artists is usually the knowledge about the technology that gets them there. And some producers don't have technical knowledge. They've got great ears and they know what it takes, but they have to hire an engineer to get them there. And they have to be able to convey to the engineer, this is what needs to happen in order for the final product to be what my artist wants it to be. And so, you know, you have in record companies, you have, you know, what they call A&R directors. They call it artist and repertoire. And those are the guys with the good ears and they know what works and they know the formulas and all that stuff for radio airplay. And, and they've got that knowledge because they've time tested the stuff in their past. And usually their wake will tell you if, if they're successful or not, if they're valid and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that was an important part, I think, that that probably needed to be mentioned when it comes to that magic with the producer. Yes. It can be magical. Uh, I think all the other elements that you talked about were spot on. Um, I don't know that, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of technical things when you start talking about, you know, the way the, the way to save your products. I'll, I'm, I mean, projects. I'll save a project in its very beginning stages, raw, what I call raw, and I keep it totally separated from each change that I make on it. So if I have, you know, a vocal and a guitar, and that's my initial idea, I'll save that. And I'll just save that because that's the original spark that started the whole ball rolling. And as it progresses, and as it matures, I'll pick different levels of, of saving it. And I'll save it, let's say it's, let's just call it XYZ song. Okay, now it's the original thing, it's saved as XYZ song, and it's just a vocal and a guitar. Then I'll put, you know, maybe piano or, you know, bass and drums or whatever. And then I'll save that as XYZ song one. And then I start to put more bells and whistles on it. And I'll save that as XYZ song um, two. And that way it's it's safe because these DAWs do have a, a real... Um, it's a safety thing that they created that, you know, automatically saves your work as you're going. 
But what happens is, is if you don't have a, a what they call a non-destructive um, backup system or you don't know how to do that, then you can lose that vital information. You can't get back to where you were before you ruined it, so to speak. And we can ruin songs by overdoing certain things as we're testing things, you know, as we're putting a string part on it versus an organ and, oh gosh, I, I really like the strings. Why did I get rid of that and put the, what was that string part? What was that? Well, if you've saved it a couple of times ago and you have a hard copy of that save without the, the auto save doing its job, you can actually go back to what that was. So that that's a kind of a safety net that I that I'll do from time to time. So, um, you know, I, I hope that that kind of helps. But I think the, um, you know, I mean, it, it's the the decision that you you know that you make when you're doing when you're deciding on a producer. You don't want to give up total control of of anything as an artist. You know, you want to be able to communicate that to your producer that look, you know, I know that. I'm I'm leaning on you for the pristine part of that, but that includes a lot of things. It, it creatively, it can it, you, you know if they're if they're a good producer, they'll be ears and they'll give you what you are looking for. The bad producers are the ones that says no, that idea is bad, and we need to do this instead. That's a bad producer. That's somebody that's in that 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 is. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That's that's um, imposing their creative creativity and 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 quashing yours. You I don't agree. want a producer like that. You want a producer that is not going to impose themselves on you and quash what you have. Now to take an idea or a quality or a direction that you are looking for and to mature it that's what a good producer will do so and they'll use their tools and their knowledge and and all of that to get you there and um but to, but to say that your idea uh, uh, in direction of something is a bad way to go i stay away from those kind of people because what they're doing is is their tunnel vision their tunnel visioned into their own creative um, um mode and they're not allowing you to be creative, you know. So uh, that that's a real that's a real uh, catchy thing, and it's the same thing with an engineer. A good engineer will keep their mouth shut until you ask them, "Can we have a little bit more thicker bass here, or what can we do to this segment?" And then they can open up and say, "Well, if you'd like, I can do this," you know. Until that point. Or they can suggest things. Say, let me let you listen to this and see what you think about this. If they've got a better creative way of doing something and give you the option to say yes or no. That's when you know you've got a good producer and a good, uh, a good uh, engineer doing their job is when they present it to you, but they don't um, impose it on you. And, so you want to you want to get upset with you, you know, get upset with you because you don't accept what yeah. they just told you. So you want a well, partnership, you know, because, not a dictatorship. <laughs> exactly. So, John. Yes. How about this? Uh, what happens when an artist is taking their time and being very decisive on how they want their music to be? Okay, so the uh, producer will say, all right, well, you know, that's the rap. And the artist is like, hold on. I'm missing something. Something's missing. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And they just feel like something's missing in it. So they want to go back and they want to do this and this and this. Well, I'm taking this from something that Jason had told me about one of his clients that Jason, he had one time. Who's Jason? Magic Jones. Oh, OK. OK. He had one of his clients one time. Uh, he said that guy was coming in for about 10 years working on the same album. All mm -hmm. right. And... Um, he wasn't happy with it over and over and over and over and over for 10 years, but he was paying for this. So is it something that I would say, Hey, let's keep working with the guy, even if it takes 50 years, you know, well, or... let's look at that. He's the artist and he's also the executive producer. Okay. He's got the money. It's his choice. 
the role of that producer is to try and as best he can to give him what he's looking for. And if he's willing to spend his money doing that and to get what he wants, then that's he's in the executive role. So, I mean, you know, your 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 music producer can say, "Look, I've had enough of you know. Here, you take it from here. Try to find somebody else to try to get you there." They've got that option to do that, but yep. Yep. you know, to take ownership of something on their own as a producer that's that's not that's not cool. You know, if mm. you have the executive, unless unless they've got you know, if they're a stakeholder in it, that's different. But um, if they're just really engineering and having the what I call the the engineer producer slash producer role, there's still somebody calling the shots if they're paying for it, you know, so it's out, uh, you know, we talk about success in music, and we talk about, you know, music that just dies, because that's really on, I mean, yes, and yes, that happens. And it's sad, sometimes, and sometimes it's a waste of money. But, you know, I have to continually go back to that music, like anything else in life, your taste in food, your taste in liquor, your taste in women, your taste in men, you know, whatever it is, it's all subjective. We are all human beings with our own opinions of what is good and what isn't good. I won't tell you, you will never hear me say something like, that's a bad song, or that sucks, or that, you know, I can't do that because what I can do is say, in my opinion, and what it does for me is it's not my cup of tea. And I can say that about myself, but for me to tell you that it's bad, I, that's, that's wrong of me to do that, I think, in my opinion. Because I've heard songs, and we've all heard this same thing, is that you get certain people that are in the industry that you feel are substandard, but they're a huge success. Have you seen that? Of course, mm-hmm. we all have. Of a course. Lot of times. And, and and there's also artists out there that are in friggin' incredible that never get the limelight. And we've all exactly. seen that. So why is that? Why 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 is that happening? That's because usually somewhere in in the in the whole Jenga makeup, there's there's a breakdown somewhere. It's happening, and the people aren't in their right spot somebody's got more control when they shouldn't have and it's been allowed or something's been disallowed when it should have been allowed stuff like that so i think what brings on the the best success of songs and things like that is how you promote certainly production is is a big part of it you're never going to get any any attention on something that well i say that now i was going to say that sounds like a tin can but i tell you Nowadays, you've got things sounding like that, and they sound really cool. You know, they sound cool in the mix. It depends on the, you know, what what the uh, the mode of the people are listening to, and and it, it it's all over the place, man. You'll have a a phase in and phase out of many different styles, and I mean, I, I, I to still to this day, my cup of tea is not rap. I can't deal with it. I don't like mm. it. Mm. It's I me. agree. <laughs> But there and there's a lot of people who who believe that same thing. But look at that market. Look at what's going on with that. It's been promoted well. It's successful. And you get some people are are taking a general um, what I call a general song and they're integrating rap portions in within it so that it becomes successful. And that's what it's that's what it's all about. You you find people that You know, you know, you put a spot of liver on the on the right next to my great meatloaf and mashed potatoes. I'm not going to eat that, and I may not like it, but that I'm not going to throw the plate out because of it. You know, right. so that's kind of what I'm what I'm saying. You know, and music is a very subjective thing, and uh, art in itself is very subjective. That's why you say things like, "Well, I don't know how many of you guys like Van Gogh or not." Well, you know, not everybody does, but. You have a lot of fans too that do so that that kind of that kind of validates what i'm trying to say when i say that it's very very subjective and, and uh, a good mind and i hope you guys uh, catch what i'm trying to say a good mind is to have a good open mind about about mm-hmm. all of it so anyway i'm off my so, soapbox <laughs> thank you 
<laughs> All right, check this out. Um, let me see. One second. Let's see where it's at. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you talk and, about and what... Marty. Let me let me also add. You know, you and I were working on your latest song. Mm-hmm. And you remember when we were we were you were asking me about well how do you think this should go and all that and usually my my response to you was well if you want to take it in a more contemporary more you know generalized form and to appeal to the general audience yeah. you can do this you remember me saying that oh yeah but I you did what you didn't hear me say is that um that's wrong and you should go that way and if you don't your song's gonna fail you didn't hear me say that right what i did i think i i actually additionally said to you that um your your time your time is not necessarily um um conventional but if that's what you like you need to keep it in there i think i said that to you oh yeah okay so there you go yeah so we have uh at least i'm consistent (laughs) What John was saying about, um, you know, good and bad, basically. He won't tell you what's bad. Um, probably behind closed doors, he'll be like, gosh, nope. Right? So what his cup of tea is, and let's talk about, one one second, let's talk about um, focus groups. So John would be in a focus group for, like, rock or contemporary or something like that. And he'd be like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm vibing with this, you know, and let's just see. I, but he wouldn't be in a focus group of jazz music. Um, so that's not where you'd want him to be or you'd want anybody to be. So you wouldn't take your focus groups of the people of the genre of music that you're working with. Right. Now, yeah. when we're talking about what's bad and I, I'm sorry, I have to pull this up. You, If you've never heard of um, Island Boy, has anybody ever heard of Island Boy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. So we have we have Fly Soldier. I'm an island boy. Uh, this was a TikTok thing, and it it blew up. And yeah. uh, well, let's let's then go to John Mayer, his uh, last train home song. Well, it has 10 million views on his channel. John Mayer is huge, right? So, what happened yeah, between John Mayer and Island Boys? Because Island Boys blew up bigger than John Mayer. And John Mayer is a fantastic artist. I mean, fantastic producing. It was just incredible. Island Boys, I'm sorry. It's just so cringe to watch that everybody, everybody in the producer role of line of everything is going, how did it happen? Why is it happening? All right. There's no, there's no way this should even be out there. But these guys, these kids, they're just, they're just living it up. Right. And and people won't stop listening to it. Even the critics won't stop listening to it. That's the best marketing that uh, these Fly Soldier, whatever their name is, uh, the Island Boys did is they made something that I'm guessing they think sounds good, but it sounds so different or so cringe that everybody's having to look it up and showing their family, their friends, you know, and saying, hey, you have to watch this. And then people are parodying it. You know, you have uh, two guys in a sink, two short guys that are in a sink that you don't know at first. And if you've never seen that, you should watch it. It's it cracked me up. But it's basically they're using that as the jacuzzi, just like the Island Boys were in uh, their their tub or whatever, or their pool outside. Uh, singing their song so you got these two short guys in a in a, in a um in a sink doing you know i'm an island boy you know that kind of stuff and it just keeps blowing up over and over and over when you got people like john mayer trying to make his last train home song a big thing island boy comes out what do you do what do you do you know so hey, that, competition that's, that's free market babe <laughs> it's free market and it just it really makes you feel though like you you took your time to create a beautiful masterpiece right and 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 maybe you did their focus groups and they loved it and everything maybe you have your fans they love it and then island boys come out yep and you're like what is that and why is that even happening <laughs> right and the record companies um Good old I will company. tell you right now, they just, you know, 
they can't stand that kind of stuff because it clutters up the market. That's what they say. You know, you get you're you're drawing attention away from something that's really not musical for real. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not really they're they're attention getters. They're they're media hounds, and they're using a, a musical portion of life to get them there because they're not really they. If they were artists before they started that, it would surprise me to hear that. I, you know, I'm, I think they they're trying to 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 v- validate who they are, and so that's the real quick way to do it. Is oh uh, yeah, we're an artist, we're a band, you know. Mm-hmm. But and it and it kind of you know. But I think you know if you if you really really you know dissect that, it's really about people parodying them and it's just a it's just a um a viral thing that people saw the way they were dressed and their hair and and the tattoos everywhere and all that kind of stuff and they're they they were like a a shock thing that people wanted to imitate and make fun of and that's what they you know that's what they've done and in the process made them probably you know tiktok you know, stars now and, and what do you call them? Um, yeah. Influencers or whatever. So anytime they come out with something, they're going to immediately be there. Well, that's the same thing with our musical world. When you're, you know, when you're focusing everything on, on just music, that's your world. Then we're all trying to break through as the viral sensation of our world in music. They've done it in the entire world, <laughs> they've done it in everything, you know, so, and you get that sometimes that's the same thing with that. Remember the little monkey that stuck his finger in his button, put it in somebody's foot or something like that. That very first <laughs> viral monkey video that came out was, they even had it on uh, America's America's Funniest Home Videos. This, and then he falls off the, the limb and it's, it's really a hilarious thing, but that was really the first start and the birthing of viral things. And now mm-hmm. we're we're surrounded by it, and they're I think they're just one of those, you know, and it, it'll it'll fizzle out. But whereas you get people like a John Mayer that will go on for years because of their their artistic ability, you know. So. Kevin, what were you saying? I was just going to say, um, the, these artists, um, for example, you were saying earlier on about Van Gogh, um, and there's an artist called Tracy Emin who made she released a piece of art which was her unmade bed and it was literally just someone's bed and it sold for thirty thousand pounds but but because people you know art is about people talking about it for better yep. or worse mm-hmm. you know i agree i it, agree with that even if it even if it has negative conversations about it at least people are talking about it and that's the pop the point of it yeah but she's not van gogh no. Ah, there you go. See, there you have it. So, the Soldier Boys song is being talked about, and it might be talked about for a couple years to come or so. Maybe, maybe twenty years down the road, it'll be here, here and there talked about. Remember that song back? What was that song back in the day? Huh. Yeah. But what you're saying, John, is John Mayer is going to keep being a legend and keep being talked about for. <laughs> years and years and probably after his death just continuously right that guy was a legend um that's where you want to be you want to be on the legend side of music instead of the one One hit one hit hit wonder yeah Yeah. one hit wonder one hit i wonder what you're doing there (laughs) yeah one or the other but so a good good question to ask after this a follow-up question would be when is a good time to release your music because you do have people that are putting out a whole bunch of stupid stuff every day just to get that laugh or that reaction out of people, which is crushing the artists out there that are really trying to put out their great work. Are you, are you asking me that or yeah. the group? Well, in my opinion, this is my own preference. I like to put on a collection of songs before I release any of them. And I'll, I'll take one song at a time and I'll bounce it off of people that I trust in the industry or, you know, family members. And I'll say, what do you think about this? How do you, you know, and that kind of stuff. And then I put them in a collection of eight or 10 songs and then I release a project. 
it's a lot easier to do it that way. For me, um, I think it gets more of a bang for its buck uh, when you do it that way. Now, but that goes old school. That's when we were doing LPs or side one, side two of a cassette ta- uh, tape or mm-hmm. so, you know, artists of my generation kind of think on those terms, eight or 10 songs. Did, have any of you guys watched the Beatle thing yet? On, Not yet. Uh, on D- Disney? Not yet. It's pretty eye opening. Um, first of all, uh, I got a new I got a new sense. You know, everything they released became hits and were great. You know, as we know them. But as mm-hmm. you're watching in this in this documentary or whatever you want to call it, movies or whatever, you see how the idea started. You know, like Hey Jude and and. Um, you know, long and winding road. He doesn't even have the lyrics for it yet. And uh, get back and and how Billy Preston became part of it and became an integral part. And how they there was so much tension between all of them that George Harrison walks off and and you know because they can't you know he feels intimidated by Paul, but Paul's trying to you know you know trying to um, walk on eggshells so he doesn't hurt his feet. You know all these elements, but. The bottom line I got from that is, is they were so disorganized. How did we get all of those hits from them <laughs> with such a disorganized bunch of guys? But it happens, and it's a real eye opener. When did they? When and how? Who made the decision to release them when they were ready to, you know, release them? They, in our minds, they're finished products, and you you change one sonic value of any of those songs and you're satan (laughs) you know because (laughs) there are people so dedicated to that and what they were but as you're listening to them even to create these songs you almost want to slap paul for why did you play it like that don't do that that's not what you came up with in the end so you want to you want to almost chastise them for learning you know what it's going to become and it's really, it's a it's a real inside you as a musician. If you're really looking at it from an open book point of view, it you know it it'll tell you something about yourself. You know how you do treat music with kid gloves when they're when they're finished products, and but at a, at a certain point, they don't really become. Um, they, they don't really become embedded in that mind that we all uh, share on certain material until we've listened to them over and over and we know them so well that that um, to, to to change them or to to adjust them or even to to edit them is is sacrilege it really is it becomes sacrilegious you know because there's something about the human brain that once you get something in a collective and you plant it in your brain and it's rehearsed in your mind and you become familiar with it and it becomes a part of you and who you are that's a finished product and if you adjust that finished product in the future you know from what you've created in your mind and your perception of that piece of art or material or whatever, then, you know, then um, it becomes, like I said, sacrilege to, to change it. Well, you know, at some point, somebody had to say, it's done. And let's, let's let everybody begin the process of making it, you know, their song in their head, that's going to be uh, a timeless thing, you know, and, uh, we can put on, uh, we can put on, Hey Jude or or you know Long and Winding Road or, and we know it, we know it, we know what sonically what it's supposed to be, and we can tell, most of us can tell if somebody else is performing it or if it was done live, you know, mm-hmm. we know that we know that something's not right about that because when it was released, it had a character about it, you know, so. Anyway, that that's kind of I hope that answered your question. I don't you know, is there a right time for you know, I think 
I think you get a collective of people and you say, what do you think? You know, and if, if you get, you know, six, six out of 10 people that says, I think it's fine, man, then to me, it's good. <laughs> you know, I'm not going right. to, I'm not going to labor over as long as it stays within the realm of Sonic, you know, that it doesn't have a lot of distortion in it or, you know, and it's a finished product as far as the, you know, production value of it is concerned. I think, you know, at a certain, at a certain point, you gotta be, you, you gotta say, that's the mix. So for instance, was it the right time for John Mayer's last train home to be released or was it just completely inconvenient that these boys rose up with, I'm a soldier boy, that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, that's, you know, that in water. itself, yeah, I think you're answering your own question. Do you think John Mayer, that was, that was the only, he was the only guy on that day to just decided to release something? No, there were probably thousands of people that had finished products that made the decision on that day to release something. You know, I mean, when you think of the world, you know, I mean, right. I try all... to think of, I try to think of trends, what's going yeah. on at the moment, the current moment trends. And, um, uh, can you hop on? I'm going to say it's funny because can you hop on that train right there? Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can hop on a trend. Well, you, you know, know, you're talking, if you're talking musical, musical um, things, which is what we're all about here, then we, we stay within, we're already, we're already notched out. Okay. We, and you know, we're not stout in several different styles. You know, you've got um, rock, uh, country, you know, jazz, uh, blues. It's th those all fall under that umbrella of music. What I think you witnessed in the TikTok thing was it had an element of music in it, but it wasn't about music. It was more about viral video, you know, mm. and that's a different category. That's that's people are doing that all the time. When you see a, um, when you see something that, you know, those TikToks, or you see a guy eating one of those chips, and you just you're drawn to see what their expression is going to be after <laughs> they hit this, you know, they just swallowed this chip, and now you know for five minutes you're going to watch them freak out and ah, give me some so milk, you know. What That's you're saying, viralism, you know. What you're saying is, if there was no video to that. If there was no video, there would be really no reaction. It would just be a song that would go down the drains as fast as it came. You mean the Island the Boy? Life. Yeah. Oh man, that has no. That had you, that. Yeah, you know, music lovers. I mean, if, if, when you get down to it, when you when you when you start to classify music lovers, they're not going to listen to that stuff. They're going to, you know, I mean, right. It's got so, to have some sort of a marketing value to it, in order for people to to latch on to it if that makes so you sense. take you take a song that's uh that ridiculous i'm gonna say i'm gonna call it ridiculous you take a song that's that ridiculous uh you add a video to it that's even more ridiculous now it's now it's going to be a hit and you take a song that's that ridiculous you add no video that's even more ridiculous and it's going to go down the drain most likely uh same thing happened back with purple rain right if you remember purple rain uh, I liked Purple Rain. I liked Purple Rain, but because the guy that was singing Purple Rain, I liked watching how he was doing this. And, you know, now today, even uh, in your cartoons, they'll mention Purple Rain and stuff like that. And you, you know what they're talking about. I'm, I'm going to bring up a point. Let me let me bring up a really, really good point. When I was 13, 14, 15, listening to music, they didn't have MTV, okay? There wasn't any such thing. So all we had was our ears to listen. And, uh, you know, I, I took on to, um, took a liking to several different, you know, people, mainly what the, the radio was feeding down my throat, my ears or whatever you want to call it. And, and that was all I was exposed to, you know, I mean, I, I didn't, you know, we didn't have, you know, things or you couldn't go to like a local library and find out everybody that's in music and you know so there was a process and them getting the music to you you know you could go to a record store and see an unknown that maybe somebody from a couple of states away has made his rounds to all the record stores and and he's not on the label and he's trying to independently you know put his record in stores that was one way to do it back then 
another thing is, is you hire companies to, um, to be on compilation things and they would pay big money to be on the same compilation uh, album as somebody like the Stones or, you know, Simon and Garfunkel or whatever. And they would pay big money to do that. And that's where record companies were always really good because they collectively put their roster of artists on their own compilations and they would send them as a promotionals to the radio stations and they would say, hey, do what you can to to get this on the radio. First of all, I'm, I don't know how far you guys go back, but there was a thing called payola. That was a big thing that was preferential treatment to artists and you couldn't, you couldn't uh, wax the wheels of the DJs. That was a federal law that the FAA put into to place that said, if you get caught accepting bribes to be able to put other artists over other artists on the radio, that's called payola, and you can go to jail for that. So th that when they instigated that law, that mean it was fair game, you know, for everyone to be able to do that. And then it was just a money game on getting it in front of the, the DJ and trying to get them to popularize it for you in several different markets. Styx was born that way, uh, the band Styx. They were from Chicago. They had a DJ that loved their song Lady. And so he started to play it and it and everybody was calling in, where is that? Where can I buy that? You know, and that that's kind of how they were born. And several groups were born like that. Um, and then you then you go into the era of MTV and it started to change. Uh, suddenly you have a visual element. Well, let me let me let me return back to to back to, to the sound only things. They would do tricks like, um, for instance, Grand Funk Railroad, they they released a live album and man, they put, I don't know if it was canned on there or not, but I was too young. I was too young to really di differentiate if it was real or not, but they, they put the sound of a crowd. Oh, here, here's a good example of it. Benny and the Jets by Elton John. You ever heard that song? Yep. Okay. Where the crowd, you can hear the crowd clapping and all that stuff. And you can't really hear him singing, but you hear a crowd and you hear clapping in there. And if you, if you analyze that song, that made it, made it feel like that there was a big crowd in the room. Well, when you visualize something of a big crowd clapping along and doing that, then you think, wow, this guy must be popular. So that was a way for a lot of bands to do that thing. Rock and roll band uh, by Boston was done. It was canned applause from a concert level audience. I don't know if you've ever heard that song, rock and roll band, everybody's playing. Da, da, da. And every time they would say something that you would hear this big roar of a crowd and it, and it gave you the visual in your mind. This is before video gave you the visual in your mind that they're in front of a big concert hall. So that translated, it translated that when they came to your town, they're a big arena style band. What you didn't know was, is that record was produced in the basement of Tom Scholz and he canned all that stuff in. He had a soundtrack of a, of a concert audience that he just, he mixed it in to that song and it made him sound like they were already successful already uh, uh, across America. And so that facilitated, you know, that facilitated them to be perceived as successful. Hmm. They couldn't they couldn't release any any video of that because he's in his basement, you know. Hey, do, <laughs> do any of you have any sound samples of big crowds that I might be able to use? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm I'm telling you, uh, um, subconsciously that works. It does. Um, if you can get away with it or make the sound as if you're alive with a crowd behind you, I've done it. You know, I've, I've done it on my stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no rule against it. But when video came along, you know, you're in a different ball game now. You know, video really changed the game because now you had, in my opinion, again, substandard musical value with a very pristine visual look that did something that to draw them in that gave them that extra edge that they didn't have to be um a steely dan musically 
they could be, you know, a three piece band that, you know, very, you know, substandard in my opinion, that's substandard or not to my cup of tea, but have a great video and become really, really successful. And that happened for a lot of artists, a lot of them, and they became successful because of it. So it's the same thing with we're, we're dealing with today. Now you've got TikTok instead of MTV. You've got TikTok and YouTube and all these other elements that we're faced with that you could utilize to start to, you know, to start to, to get yourself um, raised above the, above the noise, so to speak. It's my belief that you should definitely have all your ducks in your, in, in your corner ahead of time, musically ducks, musical ducks, you know, in place before you attempt that, you know, so right. that way so you're prepared for it. Create. And I also had the uh, philosophy that you should be ready for the viral sensation to happen. There's nothing worse for you to be a one hit wonder. And that why those happened is because people got too overexcited. They knew they had a good song and they would release it and nothing ready to back it up. If you're going to do an album, I would say do to no less than two albums, but maybe even three albums because album one, if it hits or song three and four and five on that album hits, they're going to be looking for more. And if mm. you're prepared to release material back to back after that, then you can sustain yourself. Uh, it's the people that will have one hit and then they haven't got anything else recorded behind it. They haven't spent the time to write. Now they're in a panic. We got to write something. Come on, guys, let's get in the studio. Let's let's sit down. Let's figure this out. Let's do this and try to try to to ditto what they did. And they it's always by that time they're forgotten, you know, so and that's that's the shame part of it. But it happens a lot. It really happens. That's why you had one hit at Wonders, you know, yeah, so, got to follow the momentum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yep. I didn't mean to go over your time frame here, but that's OK. No, it's yeah. all good stuff. Yeah. All good stuff. Thank you. Yeah. So what you're saying. Thank you, John. Is make a video of a uh, couple people in a crowd get a vfx artist to dub those people up like crazy make it look like a huge crowd and put that on tiktok many different ways you could you could do it with you know, clever clever editing that could be done kevin's like i got this <laughs> <laughs> well there's a lot of guys right now i think the uh the ones I, I'm drawn to are the guys that are, they got the ping pong ball and, and they're throwing it down two stories and it lands in the cup. Mm -hmm. And then they've got like seven or eight of those, you know, where he throws the CD and it lands in the slot, you know, across the room. And, and then he throws the basketball off the mountain and it goes through the hoop. And, you know, all those are the ones that will, that will, you know, there's a reason why they're, they're making a compilation of that stuff because they know they're going to get thousands of people that are going to share that, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's, their, that's, they went out to do that. But, uh, I will tell you probably half of those, or if not more are not prepared for the next one, you know, they mm -hmm. don't have something to back it up. If they were smart, they would have done 50 of those and then put seven on six or, you know, maybe 10 of them on each one of them and then release them, you know, back to back as one, reaches its peak and they know it's it's starting to peak down then release another one you know and then that crowd the same crowd that watched their first one is going to come over here and watch their second one and then after that one does its peak and fills it out you go on to the third segment segment that's that's always been my philosophy though mm -hmm. be yeah, prepared you know <laughs> so. so real fast something on youtube that you can make a big mistake on is releasing too much music into uh I would say short intervals. Um, you have too much stuff on your channel. If you have too much stuff on your channel, then people go through this or that and they're like, yeah, this is good, but they're skipping a lot of stuff too. So how can you group that up into this is album one, this is album two, this is album three. Um, would you create separate YouTube channels for that? Or would you just, I've seen well, what you, you have, did on your channel. I've seen what if Jason you were doing did on it on YouTube. Channel, I would do it in, under videos. under playlist. You know, 
Right. Yeah. You have a, That's you what have, I've done. Yeah. So Playlists. Just do it in a playlist and say, this is album one. Different it, contents. It's, yeah, it's it's comprised of eight cuts, and then here's album two comprised of ten cuts and whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. So. All right. All right, guys. Well, we're a little bit over time. My apologies, but uh, I think it was a good session. Got a lot out oh, of very, it. Very good one. Yeah. Oh, great viewpoints from yeah, all sides. Very interesting session as usual. Uh, sorry for disturbing you when I was in my car. Uh, oh, that's okay. I just put you on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I was looking for the right button, but you <laughs> you anticipated me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and final, let me let me say that I know I've got a, a, a lot of opinions, but my opinions are based on my experiences and they may not be yours. So as they say in music, and my professor said this when I was, uh, when I graduated in my music theory classes, he walked up to, to me and he said, John, you've been a great student. You, uh, you know, you did everything the right way. And he said, uh, now I need to tell you something real important. And I've just looked at him and he said, uh, there's no rules. <laughs> that was his last statement. And he said, good luck with your, with your future. And I would, it just blew me away after learning all of that stuff and him giving me grades and me studying so hard to get those A's and whatever it is I was looking for. And then he walks up to me and he says, there's no rules. You know, you know, I know, you know, all this stuff now, but guess what? <laughs> there's no rules. So right. and that's what I would like for you guys to get out of this too. I may have opinions about things and I may, you know, but they're really uh, based on my own experiences and, and there is no rules. So excellent. Whatever yeah. works. Respect for that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank if, you. If there's any topics you'd like to submit, uh, please do so for our next okay. meeting. Okay. So uh, that definitely would help out uh, if you'd like some topics researched and done and so talked about in the next meeting. You can do it in the submittal form on the Cusp Productions webpage. Okay. Okay. Hey, right. Martin, if, yeah. if I can get you to meet me on Discord for a minute. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. <laughs> no, I just want to test that that system out real quick. See no, if it's all working. Right. All right. All right. Take care, everyone. Ciao, Bye. Bye. Ciao, John, Ciao, Kevin, Martin. Bye-bye. Right. See you later, everybody. Ciao, everybody.